While the note's sudden appearance was mysterious as hell, none of them had steered us wrong so far, and this one was pointing us towards what might be a very serious problem. On the list of incredibly horrible things that can go wrong during warp transit, Geller field failure is pretty much at the top. The Geller field generator is literally the anti-getting-devoured-by-demonic-horrors device. It is rather important that it keeps performing that function at all times while traveling through the warp. The squad kitted up while Sarge calmed Jim and asked nicely if he'd heard about anything about problems with the Geller field. We all watched as Sarge's face started turning white, then red, then purple. We bailed out of the room just ahead of the explosion of rage, and even through the sealed hatch, we heard Sarge taking out a lot of frustration on poor Jim. The high points included, What do you mean which one? Why are there six? Who in their right mind would install a damaged Gellerfield generator? Who in their right mind would install six damaged Gellerfield generators? No, there is not a difference between damaged and refurbished. What do you mean it was in the technical briefing? What technical briefing for who? Where's Nubby? I'll strangle murder that little bastard. Good deal, I'll show him a good deal. At that point, Sarge burst through the hatch, and Nubby decided it was a good time to go check what had set off the outer perimeter alarm, while the rest of us restrained the irate noncom. Eventually, we got Sarge calmed down enough to speak coherently, and he explained the whole messed up situation to us. Apparently, the ship's Geller field had been scrapped and replaced by several smaller models that had been scavenged from Emperor Nosewear. There were three along the length of the ship, one near the bridge, and two covering the top and bottom decks. We were currently near the one in the bow, and from the look of things, it was on the fritz. Jim said he'd take a look at it, and suggested that we move our quarters farther back into the coverage of one of the other generators. That sounded like a good idea, but we decided to take it a step further. We weren't just going to find some random rooms in the next section of the ship. We were going to hike our asses down to that Gellerfield generator, set up camp, and bloody well sleep on it. There was not going to be any screwing around with this nightmare business. Sack time is practically sacred, and anything that disturbs it must be immediately dealt with. A guardsman who can't fall asleep the second the perimeter is secure is not a true guardsman. We packed up our quarters. Rations, field gear, traps, munitions, everything we had was coming with us. As Twitch pulled down his perimeter defenses, he found the triggered alarm tucked away in the side of a corridor with a note that said, Please do not obstruct the corridors. That was a little disconcerting, but was something we could worry about later. The hike aft went pretty quickly after we navigated up to the big spinal corridor. It was really the most comfortable way to get around the ship, even if it was filled with servitors. Before long, we were in a giant room filled with arcane machinery and glowing shit that had a note on it that said, Midship Geller Field Generator. Do not ever touch. Ever. This means you. On the door. You'd think it would be uncomfortable sleeping inside a room filled with sparking machinery and delicate devices that you must not touch. But it really wasn't. The noise was considerably less than an artillery barrage, and unlike Twitch's little perimeter traps, everything we needed to avoid was either very obvious or labeled. We were all quite happy with our new base and slept like babies that night. The next few days were relatively peaceful. We all felt that enough stuff had gone wrong for the shoe to qualify as dropped. 
All that was left to do was make ourselves as comfortable as possible for the rest of the trip. Each of us kept busy in our own ways, whether it was exploring the ship and working on the map, helping Jim and Hannah, or compulsively fortifying the perimeter. We made it almost a week before the next crisis. One morning, as Sarge was going through his daily drills with Cutter, Nubby poked his head in and asked if Twitch was allowed to keep his unused explosives in the generator room. A few minutes later, both of them were examining an impressive pile of ordnance that was sitting out of the way behind some glowing pillars. And a few minutes after that, everyone was called in for a good old-fashioned safety lecture and public reaming. The lecture came to a sudden stop when Twitch looked at the pile and informed us that the explosives weren't his, and were definitely armed. Someone was trying to blow up our base, and for once, it wasn't us. This was deeply disturbing. As Twitch went about disarming the explosives, he gave the rest of us a pretty detailed critique. The bombs had been there for a fairly long time, were set up for remote detonation, and had been installed by someone who was nowhere near as good as Twitch. A little thinking led us to believe that the explosives had been placed by someone fairly familiar with the ship, but not with blowing things up. Also, there was probably a few more bombs around. Otherwise, why bother with the remote detonator? While Twitch finished removing the explosives, Sarge called the Acolytes and explained the situation. Jim and Hannah were pretty impressed by the discovery, and the call was quickly kicked upstairs. Then their superiors kicked us upstairs again, and again, until finally we were talking to the ever unresponsive head tech priest, the Cogton, as it were, of the horrible death trap we were all flying on. For the fifth or sixth time, Sarge explained that someone had mined key components of the ship we were all on, and it might be a good idea to do something about it. The Cogton did not dignify us with a response, and instead rattled off a bunch of binary at the other tech priests on the line. There was a lot of the stupid cogboy screeching, and it sounded like they were taking the situation fairly seriously. None of them told us anything, though. Eventually, we got tired of them talking over our heads, and Sarge suggested that perhaps the resident demolitions expert should look into the matter. Maybe Twitch and his good buddies, you know, the guys who found the bombs in the first place, should check out the other Gellerfield generators and engines and such. This actually got a response. A horribly distorted voice told us to stand down and stay away from his machines, and then we were disconnected from the channel. That's gratitude for you. About ten minutes later, a massive series of explosions shook the ship. Bloody tech priests. Now, we knew a fair bit about explosions. Every veteran guardsman does. And we were pretty damn sure that five bombs the size of the one we just defused had gone off. To us, that suggested that the explosives had all been linked to go off when someone screwed up while defusing one of them. So chances were that the ship was down a few cogboys and major systems. We weren't really concerned about that first point, but the second was worrying. Depending on which systems had gone down, we were in for a whole spectrum of unpleasantness, ranging from sudden fiery death to less sudden chilly death, to lingering insane death. Sarge decided that it was probably a good idea to figure out which one we were headed for. While the rest of us got our weapons ready, Sarge tried to calm the two acolytes. The contact code for Jim still wasn't letting us through. Whatever the Cogton had done to kick us out seemed fairly permanent. But after a few tries, he was able to get a hold of Hannah. The poor Cog girl was not cut out for this stuff, and sounded like she was on the brink of tears. 
Luckily, Sarge knew how to deal with shell-shocked rookies, and with Doc's help, managed to calm her down enough to get a status report. The news was not good. The Gellerfield generators that covered the gaps in the top and bottom decks were completely destroyed, and both the fore and aft ones were damaged. Only the generator we were sitting on and the one up near the bridge were undamaged, and between them and the two slightly damaged ones, there was just enough coverage to keep the whole ship from turning into a miniature demon world. It was still a very bad idea to stay in the warp longer than necessary. When Sarge asked Hannah how soon we were dropping out of the warp to do repairs, the poor girl dissolved into tears and broke the real bad news. The warp drive was offline. The warp drive was the insanely complex device that moved the ship from boring, empty, die of asphyxiation or starving space to horrible, demon-filled, die-insane-choking-on-your-own-intestines warp space. Of course, the whole point of this is that there are much higher speed limits in the warp or something. What's a little demonic incursion if it gets you there faster, right? Well, that is a little unfair. The difference between a 200-year and two-week journey is pretty significant but we were understandably bitter about the whole thing. The problem was that if your warp drive breaks down while you're in the warp, you don't just pop back into reality. No. You're stuck there until someone fixes it. If they can fix it, that is. Otherwise, you might as well skip right to the insanity, cannibalism, and demon worshipping and save a little time. Things were bad, but they could have been much worse. We weren't dead yet, and we had a moderately functional Geller field. The plasma engines were still running fine, and we were damn well going to believe that the warp drive was repairable unless the Emperor himself showed up and told us it wasn't. We got our shit together armed the lethal perimeter defenses, and put up a few signs to warn anyone that trying to get near the Gellerfield generator without our help was just a very painful method of suicide. We were going to hike our asses down to the warp drive and take a look at it in person, because as far as we could tell, no one else here was competent enough to do it. Of course, none of us had any idea how to fix a warp drive, or even what one looked like, but we weren't going to let some minor thing like that stop us. That's not to say we didn't understand the limits of our knowledge or skills. None of us were going to try and fix the machinery ourselves unless we had to. We'd simply start grabbing tech priests and throwing them at the problem until they fixed it. Now, we were perfectly aware that the Cogton and the rest of the techies were probably trying to fix the problem, but they really hadn't impressed us with how they handled the explosives. We felt that a little oversight from the few people on board who hadn't had the common sense part of their brain replaced with a little box of screws might help things along. Our first instinct was to grab one of the acolytes. Unfortunately, Hannah had been near a blast and was trapped in a room up in the bow of the ship, and we still couldn't contact Jim. We didn't really have time to go retrieve either of them, so we figured that we might as well just shanghai the first tech priest we came across. Prior to everything hitting the fan, Doc had spotted a cogboy bossing around a bunch of servitors a few days back towards the rear of the ship. Then he remembered that the tech priest had been doing something vaguely repair-like to a large conduit. This sounded like a good candidate for fixing the warp drive, so we lined up behind Doc and went off to see if the techie was still there. We made it to the bay where Doc had seen the tech priest pretty quickly. We'd mapped the whole area earlier, and nothing nearby was damaged. Unfortunately, all we found inside was a horrible smell and a partially opened conduit that was helpfully labeled Dead Felid Inside. Do not open. But the 
far door was open, and so was one in the next room. The cogboy had obviously been in a rush to get somewhere. He'd even cut through some of the thinner bulkheads, and since he seemed to be going towards the area where the warp drive was located, we decided to follow his trail. We made good time following the path the tech priest had blazed, but the further we traveled, the more uneasy all of us felt. Twitch swore that someone was following us. Doc thought he heard other squad members whispering, and the rest of us were just generally uncomfortable. It became apparent that we were leaving coverage of the undamaged Gellerfield. From here on out, shit was going to get spooky. Reality was actually pretty stable where we were, but the minor fluctuations definitely weren't fun. Mostly it was a uh, little sounds or flashes of movement at the edges of our vision. And occasionally, one of us would feel a flash of rage or paranoia. It was easy to get distracted, but Sarge kept us focused. And nothing really bad happened until we caught up with the tech priest and his servitors. Cutter was on point, and as he entered a doorway, a servitor lunged at him with a welding torch. Luckily, he had his chainsword ready, and easily parried the blow, then returned the favor. At that point, several more servitors lurched forward, and in a rare burst of sanity, our melee specialist leapt backwards out of the doorway. The second he cleared the line of fire, the rest of us began pouring lace fire into the approaching servitors. These weren't combat servitors, thank the Emperor, but they were still damned hard to kill. Even with the hotshot laser guns Nubby had gotten us, it took a headshot or several joint shots to put each one down. Worse, they definitely didn't have any morale to break. The horde just kept advancing with glowing eyes and sparking tools. We mowed them down without any getting through the door, though near the end one of them cut through the wall and barely missed Twitch. Once we were sure they were all dead which was remarkably easy since all of their eyes stopped glowing with demonic light when you finished them, we advanced into the room. We figured that the puddle with all the clunky bits in it was probably the tech priest we were following. So much for having him repair the warp drive. It wasn't a total loss, though. The cogboy had booted up a communications console before he died, and we definitely learned a few things about the state of the ship during our little chase. Mostly that servitors could be possessed or something, and a weak Gellerfield meant slowly going insane. But that was still something. From here on out, we were going to operate on the assumption that all servitors would try to kill us, unless proven otherwise. Twitch suggested we follow the same rule for tech priests, but was vetoed since we'd probably need a few of them alive to get things fixed. The console the former tech priest had warmed up for us was waiting for input, so Sarge decided to call the Cogton and tell him we were heading towards the warp drive to lend assistance. In retrospect, this was a horrible idea. None of us had really expected him to be helpful, but we were sort of hoping he'd understand the squad full of well-trained soldiers would be an excellent escort for one of the nearby tech priests, and maybe point us towards them. Instead, we got a burst of binary and a distorted screech telling us not to desecrate his machines and to let the servitors fix the problem. Sarge tried to explain the servitors appeared to be possessed, and we're not likely to be fixing anything. But all that got was a screech that sounded an awful lot like ignorant meat bags, and the console locked us out. Bloody tech priests. Before this, we'd been operating on the usual assumption that the local leadership was moderately incompetent. But after that little tantrum, we decided to upgrade them to pants-on-head retarded. This meant that, as far as we were concerned, Sarge had operational command, and we weren't even going to try 
talking to the senior techies anymore. The only way we'd start listening to them again was if they showed up with a lot more firepower than we could muster. That decided, we headed towards the warp drive. Aside from the little warpy annoyances, the rest of the trip wasn't so bad. Mostly, it was just a matter of navigating the maze of corridors, reading the helpful notes, and dodging the occasional group of servitors. They all seemed to be headed towards the top of the ship, which was a little odd, but it made them easy to avoid. Unfortunately, we didn't run into any other tech priests during the walk, so when we finally got to the warp drive, there wasn't much we could do. The drive was obviously in bad shape. About a third of the room had been destroyed by the explosion, and there were some pretty big pieces of shrapnel sticking out of the big glowy pillar thing. We couldn't help but notice the lack of servitors fixing things, which pretty much proved our theory about the Cogton's competence, or lack thereof. On the bright side, there weren't any servitors around to try and kill us, so it was easy to set up a perimeter around the drive room. Of course, we still needed to find someone to fix the damn drive, so Sarge ordered Twitch to hold the fort while the rest of the squad went off to search for a tech priest. We got pretty lucky with that. The fifth room we checked had two of them in it. Well, not really two. More like one and a bit. Well, bits. Yeah, lots of bits. The important thing, though, was that the living tech priest was Jim. The acolyte was trying to put his boss back together, like a very leaky jigsaw puzzle, and didn't seem to be all there. Well, Sergeant Doc knew how to deal with this sort of thing, though, and before long they had Jim up and moving, if still a bit shaken up. As we led him back to the warp drive, he kept insisting that his orders were to clean the incense burners down near Engine 3. Apparently, the Cogton would be furious if he didn't finish before the next maintenance cycle. We tried to explain that fixing the warp drive probably took priority but he was very insistent. When logic didn't work, Nubby took a stab. He wheedled, cajoled, and outright lied to the distraught cogboy. See, we were actually working on the direct orders of the Cogton, and he said it was very important that we fix the warp drive and every tech priest was supposed to help us. In fact, he had specifically said Jim should fix it because he was very impressed with all the techy things that Jim had been doing. Also, no, he shouldn't call the Cogton to make sure. The Cogton said he was very busy doing things with machines and servitors and stuff. To everyone's surprise, Jim accepted this complete load of horse shit and started poking at the damaged drive. Of course, Jim was just a low-level acolyte and knew very little about warp drives, but there were quite a few of the helpful little notes around. He was able to pinpoint several broken components that he knew how to fix, but unfortunately some of those fixes would require rare and expensive parts. Parts that were so rarely replaced that no spares had even been included in the ship's inventory. Now this sounds really bad at first, but after you spend some time in the guard, you learn the difference between what's officially in the inventory and what's available if you're willing to get out a crowbar. Now B got a full list of parts from the boy and went through each one and quizzed the acolyte about what other ship systems might use them. Some were pretty much unique to the warp drive but it turned out that most of the really important ones were also used in Geller field generators. We got our map, plotted a route, gave Jim a pistol, and went to make a supply run. The first step of our shopping trip was deciding which Geller field generator to plunder. The best candidates for scavenging the parts we needed in one go were the intact generators in the middle of the ship up near the bridge. Unfortunately, those parts were rather critical, 
and ripping them out would probably break either generator. Since those two undamaged generators were probably all that was keeping the ship in reality, we opted to try our luck with one of the damaged ones instead. The one in the rear of the ship was right out. We needed the engines and warp drive to stay demon-free. So really, the only option was the generator all the way at the bow of the ship. It was going to be a long walk. In an effort to speed up our journey, we decided to divert to the big spinal freight corridor that ran the length of the ship. As we made our way upwards, we reached the ragged edge of the Gellerfield's coverage, and every one of us began to feel reality's grip weakening. Cutter's sword started talking to him. Doc's teeth began to itch. Nubby could feel his old legs. And when Sarge and Twitch opened a door, they saw a headless corpse and a charred skeleton playing poker. Neither of them seemed unfriendly, but we still elected to go around that room. When we reached an entrance to the big corridor, Twitch and Jim opened up a small viewport and scouted the place. They closed it very fast. According to them, the corridor was packed with glowy-eyed servitors, and they were all working on something. Twitch also spotted a few minor demons, which seemed to be randomly split between fighting the servitors, helping them, and staying out of their way. None of us knew what to make of that, but it was pretty clear that the main corridor was now possessed servitor territory. We resigned ourselves to a long slow hike, and headed back down into the ship. Mostly, the trip was boring. The novelty of the ship's horrible design had worn off long ago, and we got used to the minor warp phenomena pretty quickly. Seen one room with faulty gravity or walls that wept blood, seen them all. It was nice when we got into the coverage of the fully functional Gellerfield. We actually stopped and took a lunch break at our old base in the generator room. While we ate, Twitch checked his traps and reported that no one had messed with them. And Jim walked us through identifying the parts he'd need from the sacrificial generator. Once we were through the fully covered region, things started to get dangerous again. We ran across a few bands of servitors that seemed to be searching the ship for something as well as the occasional minor demon. None of us saw any profit in slugging it out, so we all did our best to stay quiet and avoid the hostiles. Thanks to Twitch and Nubby's scouting abilities, we mostly succeeded, and the single pack of servitors and handful of demons we couldn't go around were easy kills. As we got closer to the Gellerfield generator, we heard fighting and picked up the pace. The source of the noise turned out to be a group of servitors trying to get into the generator room, which someone inside was vigorously defending. We figured that some of the tech priests were holed up in there and hit the servitors in the rear. It was a clean fight, and once Cutter had finished off the last one, we cautiously made our way into the room. Surprisingly, it was not filled with tech priests, Instead, it contained a mob of pale old men. They were armed with what looked like modified power tools, and each of them had a few yellow notepads sticking out of their pockets. While it was a bit of a surprise to run into a bunch of stowaways, we'd sort of expected something like this. When the notes kept appearing, we knew it was either some incredibly helpful person, or some sort of warp trickery or machine spirit weirdness. All of us had been fervently hoping for the helpful person explanation. For obvious reasons. We hadn't been prepared for just how old they were, though. These guys looked like they were all over a hundred. The beardiest of the stowaways greeted us all by name which was a little creepy, introduced himself as Old Bill, and thanked us for the help. He was apparently the leader of a group of crew members who hadn't been willing to leave the ship. They'd outlived three captains already, 
and they'd be damned if they wouldn't outlive a fourth. Sarge processed this, then decided to skip all the bullshit about mysteries, notes, secret passages, and all that in favor of actually getting shit done. He explained the situation with the warp drive, our plan to rip the generator they'd all been defending apart, and then asked the old men what it would take to get their support. The old geezers weren't keen on scrapping the generator, but when Jim explained the damage to the warp drive, they agreed that it was necessary. The problem was that the old geezers weren't the only stowaways on the ship. They'd had a bunch of friends and even some family living in Hydroponics Bay 7C, and when the Geller Field collapsed, those folks would be ass-deep in demons. The old men would throw in with us if we went and evacuated everyone to a safer part of the ship and also, just while we were in the area, got rid of the small army of servitors laying siege to the hydroponics bay. All in all, this was a pretty good deal. Jim was going to need some time and help getting the parts ready to be pulled out, and we didn't have anything better to do. Before we went anywhere, though, we had a few things to take care of. While Twitch pulled out a few of his toys and beefed the generator room's defenses, the rest of us went to find Hannah, who was supposedly in one of the nearby damaged rooms. We found the poor cog girl trapped behind some rubble. And with the help of a lace cutter we pried off one of the servitors, we got her out of there. Hannah wasn't very happy. In fact, she was practically hysterical. But she was relatively unscathed. None of us were well-equipped to handle a panicking cog girl, so Doc gave her a few band-aids and we unceremoniously dumped her on Jim and the old guys. Our heroic rescue mission successful, we gathered up Twitch and went to get the rest of the stowaways out of their hydroponics bay. The directions that Bill gave us were great, and we quickly reached the bay's access corridor. He hadn't been exaggerating about the small army of servitors, though. In fact, it was more of a medium army now, and there were a few demons in there too. They seemed keen on something inside the bay, but weren't making much headway against the big-ass doors. That was a good thing, because we definitely couldn't handle all those servitors with our current loadout. We needed to make a plan. We debated the problem for a while. Twitch was in favor of setting a large explosive trap. Doc thought there might be another way into the bay. Sarge explained to Nubby that we couldn't just tell the old guys that they were dead when we got there, and Cutter was talking to his sword again. Eventually, we decided to go with Doc's suggestion and started scouting the surrounding area. That's how we found Hydroponics Bay 9D. The bay that the stowaways lived in had some big warnings painted on the door. Stuff like, Do not enter, use console to request rations, hazardous materials, and incredibly dangerous never open. 9D's doors just had three meter high letters that said, Beware of Narlock. Of course, we didn't believe that for a second. There was absolutely no reason for there to be a narlock on an imperial vessel. It was absolutely just a ruse to keep people out. This meant it was probably another entrance to the stowaways bay. With any luck, we could cut through there and get everyone out without the servitors noticing. About 30 seconds after we jimmied open the big cargo doors, we slammed them shut again, because holy shit, that narlock looked pissed. We decided to take a little breather after that scare and reconsider our options. The bad news was that we definitely weren't sneaking through that hydroponics bay. But on the other hand, we had an amazing distraction available to us. All we had to do was get it out of the bay and down one level, then it would keep the servitors busy while we snuck in. A little tinkering with the door controls and a nearby lift, a few dead servitors, and we were ready to rock. 
It worked like a charm. The Narlock barreled out of the bay the second the doors were open, and ran right into a pile of servitor corpses sitting on the elevator. We activated the lift and watched with delight as the entire army of servitors turned to face the new threat. As much as we wanted to stay around and watch the fight, we had stuff to do. The second the last servitors left the room, we dashed over to the bay's comm panels and nicely asked them to open up. I'm not sure what we expected to find in there, but it definitely wasn't a flourishing tribal village in the middle of a small jungle. Seriously, it was an entire village. Grass huts and everything. There must have been over 200 of them in there. Just hanging out and living a relatively simple agricultural life in the middle of a bloody spaceship. We'd seen weirder things. Hell, we'd just started a fight between a spacefaring dinosaur and a bunch of possessed mechanical corpses. But this was definitely one of those special memories that would stay with us. It was remarkably easy to get them evacuated. This wasn't the first time they'd migrated to a new home, and old Bill had called ahead to make sure they knew the score. They gathered up most of their village into packs and cargo trolleys, and then we all got the hell out of there. As we walked, the sounds of battle echoed in the distance, along with the occasional roar. We congratulated ourselves on our brilliant planning, and assured each other that there was no way this was going to come back and bite us in the ass. We led the migration back to the generator room without serious incident. The tribals seemed pretty tough, and between us and their warriors, we easily managed to kill the few demons and servitors we ran into. Once we arrived, Bill detailed a few of his men to lead them to a safer area, then invited us in to look at the preparations for pulling out the parts. We'd expected everything to be more or less ready. They had all the tools and knowledge of the ship, after all. It should have just been a matter of us saying it was time to go. Then they'd pull everything out and that'd be that. Instead, they gave us a bewildering briefing about what to cut, what to grab, how to carry it, and where to go. Then they left. They didn't offer to help or check if we agreed with their plan. Hell, they didn't even ask if we understood everything. They just bossed us around, wished us luck, then left. In the words of that ancient guardsman hero, Olanius Pius, why the hell is everything always our job? We didn't spend too long wallowing in self-pity, though. You get used to this sort of thing when you're a guardsman. Sergeant Doc pulled their heads together and formed a plan. Nubby and Cutter went over the instructions we'd all been given, and Twitch cleared up his traps. Jim had marked out what needed to be cut, what needed to be grabbed, and what order to do it in. All we had to do was run to safety, and we were damned good at that. It would all be relatively simple, except for the fact that the Geller field would be collapsing around us. Doc and Sarge put a lot of thought into who would be carrying what. Nubby was the fastest one of us, thanks to his augmentic legs, so he'd grab the last parts. Sergeant Cutter were the strongest and would handle the heavy parts. Finally, Twitch and Doc would keep their weapons free to cover the rest of us. Each of us memorized our role on the plan, reviewed the map and directions Bill gave us, and got ready to run like the demons of the warp were pursuing us, because they probably would be. Sarge called Jim and Bill, made sure everyone was clear, and counted down. We worked fast ripping out part after part as cables sparked and alarms blared all around us. The second the final piece was out, we barreled out of the now smoke-filled room and ran like hell. We got about 50 meters before we felt the Geller field start to fail, and reality went runny around the edges. The whispers, flashes of movement, and sudden emotions hit us first. Doc and Twitch fired at several shadows, only one of which had an actual demon in it. 
Sarge started screaming at Nubby and vowed to beat the little trooper to death with his own augmatic legs, and Cutter began apologizing to his sword for not using her enough. We managed to keep together and keep moving, though. Even if Nubby had to take the lead, since Sarge was pretty much chasing him now. The gravity fluctuations and bleeding walls came next, along with a few more minor arcane horrors that just sort of blinked at us as we barreled past. Twice we got slammed off our feet when down changed to left or right but we'd taken those extra few seconds to tie down the parts and didn't lose anything. We did get damned messy. Luckily, warp blood washes out just fine. Our first serious demon encounter came at about the halfway mark. Nubby came backpedaling out of room screaming about eyes and tentacles, and we just barely managed to stop and shut the door in time. We tried to divert around, but both of the side passages seemed to open into the same place, a room which appeared to be several kilometers across and filled with fire. There wasn't time for this shit, so we popped open the hatch, chucked in four grenades and one of Twitch's debt packs, and slammed it again. The second the bang went off, we opened it up and just sprinted across the room while doing our best to ignore the writhing tentacles. We got a few rooms past that without incident, then found ourselves in some sort of infinite loop of corridors. After the third time, we passed a door labeled Temporary Sewage Storage, where a suit, we realized what was happening and stopped to figure things out. Behind us, a door banged open, and a mass of tentacles started pouring out. Cutter leapt into action and started hacking off limbs, while the rest of us started wildly opening doors. The first one had what looked like the hospital ear and that bitch of an interrogator tied up and screaming for help inside. Sarge slammed it shut before anyone else could move. The second and third were filled with more tentacles and fire, respectively, but we got them closed before anything bad happened. The next one had that headless corpse and charred skeleton playing poker again. Now that we saw it a second time, the corpse wasn't quite headless, he just had a bad case of exit wound face. When we opened the door, he casually waved at us, then rested what was left of his head on the table while his partner turned to face us. The well-done skeleton laughed and told us we probably wanted the door across the hall that was labeled light cargo only. From his resting spot on the table, the nearly headless corpse gurgled something which prompted the skeleton to laugh again and warned us not to open the poo door. Doc awkwardly thanked him and slammed the hatch shut. After a brief debate, we took the jolly skeleton's advice. He seemed pretty trustworthy, and piled through the marked door. A second later, we piled back out, grabbed Cutter, and dragged him after us. There weren't any side passages in the next two rooms, and when we barreled through the last door, we found ourselves back in familiar territory near the edge of the safe zone. As we ran, reality finally started to get its shit back together, and the going got significantly easier. We started picking up speed, only stopping to pop a few minor demons and divert around a pit that opened up into the huge fiery room again. Then, right as we started running down the last hallway, a large sword slammed through a door and Cutter immediately abandoned his cart in favor of having a sword fight with a demon. You could say that it was an act of heroic bravery or selfless sacrifice, but you'd be wrong. It was an act of complete and utter retardation, and only Sarge grabbing him by the legs while everyone else gave covering fire saved his stupid life. The demon followed, of course, but hot shots pack a punch, and we kept him back long enough for Twitch to drop a few mines. The second they were down, we ran like little girls and just barely got around a corner before that demon went bang. 
We didn't go back to check if it was dead. As long as it wasn't following us, we were happy. Cutter had gotten a pretty mean chest wound before Sarge yanked him away, and wasn't looking too hot as we dumped him onto one of the carts. Once the squad was fully inside the safe zone, we stopped in a handy room, and Doc got to work on him. While he did the stitching and stuff, Sarge called the Acolytes and had them send someone to take the loot the rest of the way. Once Cutter was sorted out, we all hiked down to the warp drive. The trip was a lot quieter this time around. The techies or the old crewmen must have beefed up the rear Geller field, and we saw a few of the tribal warriors standing guard at junctions. When we reached the drive room, the place was a hive of activity. Jim and Hannah were running around fixing things, the stowaways were acting as assistants and advisors, and old Bill was yelling directions at everyone. The second he saw us, old Bill waved us over and filled us in. Repairs were going well, the perimeter was holding up fine, and it wouldn't be long until we could shift back into real space. We all breathed a sigh of relief. But before anyone could celebrate, Hannah poked her head out of a gutted machine and reported that some piece of warpy tech was busted. Everyone went quiet at this. Old Bill thought hard for a few seconds, then brightened up and told everyone not to worry. There was a spare aboard. The old bugger turned to us, gave a toothless smile, and said he needed a few brave lads to fetch a part from the Psyker holding cells downstairs. As one, we turned to Nubby, who started to sidle out of the room. You see, with the exception of Cutter, all of us had a bit of experience with Psykers and ships with Psyker holding cells. We'd been part of a team which had busted up a corrupt government group that was gathering up all of a planet's nascent psychers, usually as children, and selling them off-world. That mission had ended with us being sent home with a scathing report, which we then doctored to make us look better. Last we'd heard, the jackass who was running the investigation was still looking for the rest of the ships which had been used to transport the kidnapped psychers. Up to this point, we'd put Nubby's position as the ship's procurer down to bureaucratic incompetence or a completely understandable desire to get him out from underfoot. From there, it was easy to blame the horrible quality of the ship on Nubby's unique Weasley incompetence as well as some of the ordinary variety from his bosses. All that went out the window the second we heard the phrase Psyker holding cells, though, and we jumped to some new conclusions. As we walked, Sarge grilled the despicable little trooper, and the truth finally came out. He'd spotted this ship in some report or other, and instead of turning it in and having it seized, the cretin had decided to try and impress his boss. Nubby had flagged the ship as a prospective purchase, and then went and swore up and down to his superior that he could get it at a much lower price than anyone else. Emperor only knows why his boss agreed. Possibly the poor man had just wanted Nubby to go away for a few months. Right up to that final meeting with the fat captain, the purchasing process had gone normally. Then Nubby, in his infinite brilliance, had told the man that he knew the ship's dirty secret and threatened to expose him if he didn't bring down the price. It wasn't hard to see why bombs had been planted on the ship or who had planted them. Damn Nubby and his bloody stupid schemes. The worst part was how he tried to defend himself pointing out that he didn't lie to nobody about nothing, and specifically said we weren't quisitors, and there weren't no hard feelings, and it was just business, and got a really good deal, even with all the dents and stuff. We were all just about ready to kill him, 
and Sarge probably would have if we didn't have any other concerns at the moment. Instead, we privately vowed that Nubby would never again be allowed any sort of authority, and if we survived this, everything would be blamed on him. Our trip started to get hairy as we descended deeper into the ship. The cells were way at the edge of the current Gellerfield coverage. Aside from the usual weirdness and the fair number of minor demons, which we killed if we couldn't avoid them, we ran into a few more of those spooky doors that opened into weird places. We got that huge fire room five times, the tentacle demon twice, and found one room inhabited by some sort of sewage monster. The last one might have been real, though. The note on the door did say, Xenos Waste Processing Device. Do not enter. The last warpy door we ran into had the rather crispy skeleton playing poker again. But now the headshot man was slumped in the armchair in the corner, and a bunch of other players had taken his place. We spotted a bunch of ghostly-looking soldiers with regimental insignias we couldn't quite make out, and some vague specters who looked eerily familiar. There was also a big guy with a sword drowning someone wearing robes in the punch bowl. As we tried to quietly shut the door, the skeleton spotted us and congratulated us on staying alive. The nearly headless one jerked up in his chair and gurgled something, then slumped back down. The burnt skeleton practically fell over laughing at this, but he caught his breath right before we slammed the door. As the hatch closed, he advised us to check the cells before we took our part. A second later, after we'd slowly backed away from the door, it popped back open, and we heard the skeleton shout that the big guy had no hard feelings and not to open the last cell. On that cryptic note, the door slammed shut again. We spent a few seconds digesting the skeleton's advice and how oddly familiar the room's occupants had been. Twitch suggested opening it up for another look, but Sarge vetoed this and led us down the last corridor to the Psyker cells. The Psyker holding cells were much, much fancier than anything we'd seen on the occurrence border. It was a fairly small place, with only a dozen actual cells, but they'd obviously been custom-built, and installed instead of scavenged. It had probably been part of the contract for hauling the psychers. The part we needed was sticking out of some arcane machine in the middle of the main room, right where old Bill said it would be. We cut open the casing, loosened the part, and left it in place while we checked what was inside the cells. The skeleton and his macabre buddies hadn't steered us wrong yet, we all got into covering positions around one of the doors. Doc opened it, peeked inside, and started swearing when he saw the occupant. The kid didn't look more than eight years old, though who knew how long he'd been laying in that stasis field. And there was a little card at the foot of his bed which had Greek letters and a list of specialties. This one was a, apparently a pyromancer and a telekine. We checked the rest of the cells, except the one we'd been warned about, and found about half of them occupied. We had five psychers between the ages of five and ten sitting in stasis, and chances were the only thing keeping them from being possessed by big-ass demons was the part we were about to take. The smart option at this point would have been to just kill them. We couldn't take their stasis beds with us, and we were in the middle of a freaking incursion here. This was just about the worst place and time to have a bunch of untrained psychers running around. In the end, though, none of us were big enough bastards to do it. One by one, we pulled them out of their beds then. Since we weren't complete idiots, we tranked them and stuffed them into our backpacks. They didn't weigh much more than a full field kit. For the second time that day, we planned our path, yanked out a piece of delicate machinery, and ran like hell. 
we didn't have to contend with nearly as much warp bullshit this time. But the second we pulled out that part, the one unopened door was dented outwards, and we heard demonic howling from every direction. We ran as fast as we could and kept our weapons ready. The first few were the minor demons we'd been seeing somewhere, and it only took a single shot to put them down. The problem was that every one cost us a second, and something was slamming up the corridors behind us. It did not sound friendly, but we were doing a pretty good job of keeping ahead of it at first. It wasn't until we ran into the larger demons that whatever was chasing us began to gain ground. That damn tentacle demon was the first one we ran into. It burst through a door as we were running past and made a grab for Doc's kid. He dodged just in time, and Cutter managed to hold the thing off long enough for the rest of us to get past. For once, we didn't need to pull the nutcase away from the fight. The second we were clear, he started falling back. Twitch tossed a few hot nades into the mess of tentacles, which kept it back long enough for us to slam a door shut and continued our run. A short time later, we heard some especially loud demonic shrieks, a few clangs, and the sound of a shut door being torn open. After that, it was clear running for a while. There were a few small fry, Another door with the two disguised demonettes, which we slammed shut. Nubby was nearly set on fire when his kid manifested a few small fireballs in his sleep, but it was basically easy going. We were getting tired, though, and whatever was behind us was gaining. We started shutting every door we went through, and Twitch began dropping mines, but as far as we could tell, that only made it matter. Eventually, it became clear that the strengthening Geller field wasn't going to stop our pursuit. So, as we ran, we got ready for a fight. The moment we ran into one of the small groups of tribal warriors, we practically threw the kids on them and slammed the door we'd come through. We piled the last of Twitch's debt packs, plus every grenade we had, around the door. Then, we got into firing positions. Half a minute later, the hatch burst open and a demon host flew through. We thought it looked like a little kid with big black wings made out of smoke, but none of us got a long enough look before the explosives went off. The second the shockwave was passed, every one of us began pouring full auto fire down the smoke-filled corridor. After a half minute of continuous firing, our view began to clear and we all heard a voice in our heads vowing vengeance as soon as it found a more suitable host. At Sarge's order, we stayed in position for a few minutes, in case it was a trick, but the demon host didn't reappear. Eventually, we declared victory and headed up to the warp drive to see how things were going. Some tribal women were caring for the kids when we got there. Doc ran over and made sure no one tried to wake them up, while the rest of us resupplied and talked to old Bill and the Acolytes. They were overjoyed to see the part we'd got for them, and immediately started welding it in place. While they worked, Bill explained that everything was pretty much ready, and all that was left to do was call up to the bridge and get whoever was piloting this thing to take us out of warp. All of us groaned at that. We knew this meant talking to the Cogton, and weren't looking forward to the conversation. Hopefully, he'd just accept that we'd all saved his bacon and hit the damned button instead of yelling about stuff. Hannah went over and tinkered with the room's comm console, and Sarge got ready to do the talking. We'd been expecting a little shouting or something. Instead, all we got was a deranged voice, screeching about weak flesh, and avatar of the Omnisaya, and the console caught fire. The consensus was that the Cogton had completely lost it, so someone had to go upstairs and hit the buttons on the bridge. Of course, everyone looked at us as they said that. 
just wasn't surprising anymore. At least we managed to convince them that we needed a short break before we ran into another fight. All of us grabbed a snack and tried to catch a few minutes of sleep. While we rested, one of Bill's men went and fetched the really heavy ordnance that we had left in our quarters. We figured that we'd need every bit of firepower we could get for this trip, because the only way to access the command deck was through the main lifts located in the big spinal corridor. The one full of possessed servitors. At least we'd be crossing it where there was good Gellerfield coverage. When our heavy weapons arrived, we staggered to our feet and got ready for one last hike. Twitch had all of his explosives, Sarge had his grenade launcher, Nubby had a few single-shot rockets, and Doc and Cutter had as much ammo as they could carry. There was no way we'd cross that corridor without being noticed, so we might as well be ready to kill whatever we ran into. We made sure we had a clean comm connection to the Acolytes and clanked our way up towards the big spinal corridor. We planned our route so we'd spend the minimal amount of time in there before we got to the lifts, and prayed to the Emperor that most of the servitors would be busy somewhere else. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. As we reached the edge of the safe zone, a pair of tribal scouts reported that the servitors were building something almost right on top of the lifts. What we saw when we peeked into the big hallway was pretty damn terrifying. The servitors were piling all sorts of materials, including themselves, into some sort of giant structure. A ring of what looked like every surviving tech priest was standing around the structure, giving commands to the servitors and chanting in binary. Up above all this activity, there was a hovering platform, and standing right in the middle of it, Screaming like a cross between a shorted Vox unit and a mechanical sprinkler was the Cogden. Also, everything was glowing, which was probably bad. We didn't wait to see what was happening, or bother to try to find a way to sneak around. We just hefted our weapons and started pouring as much fire as possible into both the glowing structure and the tech priests. Meat and metal flew everywhere. Our first volley tore apart dozens of servitors and cogboys, but to our surprise, they didn't react at all. They just ignored us while they kept chanting and building. We didn't stop to ponder this. If they were going to hold still and be easy targets, we were going to take advantage of it. Unfortunately, this happy state didn't last for long. Before we could kill more than half the tech priests, the chanting rose to a crescendo, and the surviving cogboys climbed onto the structure with the last of the servitors. The cogton stepped off his platform onto the top of the thing, and with a slow, smooth movement, the whole damn pile stood up. It was like some sort of servitor titan, and boy was it pissed. We poured the rest of our launcher rounds and missiles into the damn thing without much effect. A few servitors dropped off, but the others sort of flowed into the holes and things just kept coming. As it approached, the Cogden kept up his screaming, and added the occasional gothic insult. We decided it was time to get the hell out of there and turn towards the door we came through. Right as we got to it, there was an especially loud screech from behind us, and the door slammed shut. Then the door on the other side of the corridor slammed shut. Finally, with a tremendous crashing sound, every door down the length of the corridor shut itself. We took a look at the doors, then at the servitor Titan, briefly pondered the situation, and started running down the corridor like scared little girls. Behind us, the monstrosity lengthened its gait and started picking up speed. 
As we ran, we dodged past a few remaining servitors and minor demons who wandered towards the Titan. We didn't stop to worry about them, but when we looked back, the monstrosity was stopping to pick them up and slap them into its body. That was probably a bad thing, but at least it was slowing the monster down. We started to gain a lead on the Serva Titan and began considering options. We were down to shooting it a lot and hoping it had a weak point, piling all our explosives together and hoping it was enough, or blasting open a door. Sarge decided to go with the big pile of mines. But just as we were getting ready to stop and set it up, we saw something ahead of us. Something about as large as the Serva Titan was coming down the corridor. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be some sort of large, bipedal lizard, with wings, black, smoky wings, also horns, and very glowy eyes. So no shit, there we were. Trapped in a hallway with a horrible servitor titan coming at us from one side, and a possessed narlock coming from the other. There were probably worse positions to be in, but damned if we could think of any at the moment. Suddenly, blasting open a door looked like the best available option. We all unhelpfully yelled at Twitch as he picked out a small door and set the minimum number of charges needed to open it up. Both the demonic horrors were closing on us as we took cover and hit the detonator. It was all we could do to stay in cover until the explosives went off. The second the door was open, we piled through and got as far away from it as possible. Behind us, there was a loud crash, and a good portion of the bulkhead around the door bent inward. A second later, there was a meteor-sounding crash, and a tremendous amount of screeching and roaring. We all watched the doorway as huge feet stomped back and forth, and the noise continued. From the look of things, the two monsters had gotten into a bit of a fight, and for the time being, we'd been forgotten. We had absolutely no desire to interrupt that fight. It was the only distraction we were likely to get, and hopefully one of them would kill the other. We ran along side rooms and passages as quickly as we could, and got as far towards the lifts as possible before we blew open another door. As soon as it was open, we started running down the corridor as fast as our legs could carry us. Every once in a while, we'd look back to make sure the giants were still fighting and hadn't noticed us. Amazingly, our luck held out, and we reached the elevators without incident. We piled onto the single large platform that would take us up to the bridge, hit the button, and breathed a sigh of relief as the fight dropped out of sight. In an offhand way, Twitch wondered if the fight would end with them combining into a Demonis Servinarla Titan. No one laughed. As we rode up, Sarge calmed Jim and the rest to make sure everything was still okay and fill them in on the situation. The Acolytes took the news about the Cogden a little hard, but otherwise everything down there was just fine. All we had to do was hit a few buttons and we'd be out of the warp. Down below us there was a titanic crash and a scream that shook the walls. Nubby pushed the up button a few more times, and Twitch started getting the rest of his explosives ready. When we reached the top of the elevator, Twitch fixed his debt packs to platform's joints, and we all headed through a pair of impressive-looking doors. The bridge was large, filled with blinking lights, had a massive but slightly cracked window that was currently covered, and was practically papered with little yellow notes. As we stood and pondered the massive array of buttons, there was another scream, and the elevator started to descend. That focused our attention nicely. We started hunting through the arrays of controls for the warp drive switch. 
Bill said it was large, blue, labeled Fire Missile Bay 26F, and had a note that said never, ever, ever touch. That last part was completely useless. Almost every note on the bridge said that, and we wondered how the Cogton had steered this thing. Maybe he just jammed his tentacle into it or something. It took a fair bit of painful trial and error to find the right switch. Every time one of us found one that looked good, we hit it and hoped for the best. Before we got the right one, we managed to find the controls for three cargo bays, a positioning engine, and the gravity for the top third of the ship. The last one nearly killed us, but Doc managed to hold on to it and get it back to normal before anyone got badly hurt. When we finally found the right switch, we flipped it down and waited for something to happen. There was a charging sound, an incredibly loud clang, and Jim helpfully informed us that a major demonic presence was keeping us from dewarping. It didn't take us long to guess what was going on, and we all ran to the elevator shaft and looked down. Twitch started giggling as the Demonis Servo Narlatitan slowly rose towards us. The thing looked pretty mean. Well, actually, it looked pretty much the same as it had before, except with a Narlock head for an arm and an undersized set of smoky wings. Still, that was way more than we wanted to fight. Sarge gave Twitch a poke, and the trooper hit all of his detonators. The platform disintegrated, along with the bottom half of the monstrosity. But as we all watched in horror, the thing sank its teeth and claws into the side of the shaft and began to climb. This was not a good thing. We had no desire to fight this horror in close combat. We got out our laser guns and grenades, and every one of us poured as much fire as possible into the thing's hands. The monstrosity made it about three quarters of the way up to us before, all at once, its normaler hand disintegrated. The thing managed to hang on with its dino arm for a moment, then plummeted down into the depths. A few seconds later, there was an impressive squishing sound. Then the universe went prolg and tasted faintly of the color yellow. We all turned and watched as the large shutters on the bridge front window started to open. The occurrence border had achieved reality. As we congratulated each other on a job well done, and wandered back towards the bridge, there was an ominous swooping sound behind us. All of us turned to face the shaft, and watched as the Cogton rose out of it, complete with smoky black wings and curly metal horns. No one moved. Not us, and not the demonic tech priest. Everyone just stood there and calculated the odds. Then Cutter revved his chainsword. The Cogton let out a horrible screeching laugh and hefted his gear shaft, and both of them lunged forwards. Each of us sprang into action like the pros we were. A torrent of laser fire plowed into the demon host, and Cutter neatly intercepted his charge. He met the Cogton's staff with his chainsword, forcing the stroke aside, and then dodged away so we could get another volley in. We repeated this trick three times before the demon host let out a scream of frustration and leveled his staff at Doc. A bolt of black lightning hit the medic in the chest and threw him into a wall. But before the Cogton could follow up his attack, Cutter brought his chainsword down and removed one of the bastard's metal arms. Unfortunately, he didn't manage to dodge the Cogden's counterstroke, and was thrown nearly to the edge of the shaft. With Cutter out of the line of fire, the rest of us poured as much lace fire as we could into the demon host, and actually started to force the foul thing back. He countered with a few more lightning bolts, but two missed their mark and the last one only fried one of Nubby's legs. We managed to push the Cogden all the way to the ledge of the shaft, where he crouched and put up some sort of shield. Behind him, 
Cutter silently got to his feet and raised his sword. Cutter didn't manage the decapitation he was aiming for, but he got one of the smoky wings and knocked the Cogden off balance. A few shots from the rest of the squad pushed him a little further, and the demon host slowly began to topple into the shaft. At the very last second, his remaining hand reached out, grabbed Cutter's ankle, and pulled it out from under him. Cutter just barely managed to grab the edge of the shaft with both hands and kick off the Cogden's grip. The demon host started to erratically fall down the shaft, flapping his remaining wing and screaming curses in a horrible mix of demonic and binary. Cutter didn't spare any attention for the falling Cogden. He was fixated on something much more important. Next to him, just barely out of reach, his chainsword was teetering from the lip of the shaft. He watched in horror as, ever so slowly, it tipped over. Sarge saw what was coming next and almost managed to get him out of there in time. Almost being the key word. The damned fool let go of the edge and swung himself towards his beloved chainsword. The non-com watched as Cutter made the catch, then dove like a falcon onto the flailing demon host. He wrapped his legs around the Cogden, raised his rescued sword, and started hacking at the metal bastard while screaming at the top of his lungs. Sergeant Twitch stood there and watched Cutter fall towards his heroic death, but Nubby, bless his blackened heart, sprinted as fast as his damaged leg could carry him back towards the bridge. About five seconds before Cutter, and what was left of the demon host, hit the ground, Nubby found the gravity control and threw it in the opposite direction. Sarge, Doc, and Twitch all slammed into the ceiling, collecting a concussion, four broken ribs, and a dislocated shoulder between them. Meanwhile, a rather bewildered Cutter flew back up the shaft on a very injured demon host. It took Nobby a few tries to get the gravity just right, but eventually he zeroed it out, and Cutter managed to flail his way to safety. As soon as he was clear, Nubby cranked up the gravity as high as it would go, and the Cogton flew down the shaft at incredible speed. Later, we checked the bottom of the elevator shaft, he punched through four decks and half of an awkwardly placed wall before he stopped. We set up camp in the bridge. Doc had a nasty burn, but it would be okay. There were a lot of minor broken bones, and Cutter had an impressive series of cuts all over his chest. The Cogton hadn't gone down easy. We were all still alive, though, and based on what Jim and Bill told us, the ship was in relatively stable condition as long as you ignored the massive warp taint in the bow, and the upper and lower decks, that is. We called that a victory and stood the hell down. It took them half a day to rig up a replacement elevator, but we didn't notice. We were busy sleeping. Getting the ship back in, well, ship shape, was a lot of work but easier than it might have been. For instance, we might have lost the navigator and astropath who steered our ship in the warp and enabled interstellar communications, respectively. We found the navigator alive and well. He'd apparently been following the standard navigator operating procedure for a warp incursion. Said procedure was just to lock yourself in your sanctum and ignore all the demonic silliness while you concentrate on steering the ship through the warp. A remarkably sane response, all things considered, and about the same as the one the astropath had been following. Except in the astropath's case, he wasn't keeping the ship from crashing into a reality reef. He was just hiding under his bed and crying. We left the navigator to his business, and pulled the astropath out, then made him send a report along to Oak. Telling your boss that you're going to be late for work because 99% of your Mechanicus contingent had been possessed by demons and subsequently purged 
is very awkward. Sarge tried to mitigate the unpleasantness of the situation by blaming everything on the Cockton. It's not like the guy was in any condition to argue. That worked to a certain degree, but we still wound up being very thankful for the slow and unreliable nature of astropathic communication. It saved us explaining the situation in detail, as well as the scathing lecture Oak would doubtlessly have given us in return. Anyway, those two psychers were the only irreplaceable components on the ship. Old Bill loudly claimed that, given enough time and duct tape, he could fix everything else. Jim and Hannah were dubious at first, but the next few weeks proved the elderly engineer right. The next few weeks were very educational, also infuriating, exhausting, and occasionally scary, but mostly educational. First, we learned how pragmatic engineers deal with sections of ship that have been warp-tainted, or only get sporadic Gellerfield coverage. You ignore them. Well, not exactly ignore. You still have to go through the effort to wall off the area and make sure nothing is living in there. Hall Bill claimed that as long as there was nothing to possess, and no way for warp entities to get into the rest of the ship, it worked fine. At least until you could come in later and cut out the whole tainted section. All of us were a little dubious, but old Bill said he'd done the procedure several times before. In fact, all of those incidents where the front fell off had been the application of this method of damage control on a large scale. He even suggested that if the shipyard was squeamish about the cost of doing a cut and refit, he knew a handy trick involving carefully lowering the void shields near a star. We pondered the melted look of the occurrence border's prow, and decided the man probably wasn't bullshitting us. After that, we learned just how many crutoid creatures had been living in the hydroponics bay with that narlock. Apparently, the previous captain had decided that having a Kroot mercenary aboard would make him seem more like a rogue traitor. Of course, when the Xenos had the gall to demand payment, it had been ditched on a planet. The Kroot's pets were harder to clear out, though. And the bay had eventually been sealed in hopes that they'd eventually starve. They hadn't. In fact, they'd multiplied and after we'd opened the bay, they'd flooded into every corner of the ship. The job of hunting every beaked beastie out of a section before it was sealed fell to us and some of the tribals. It was rather disconcerting how many had started to mutate by the time we'd found them. Finally, we learned that despite its size, it only really took about 50 crewmen to fly the occurrence border if you didn't have to worry about cargo hauling or complex life support systems, that is. We managed to scrape up enough hands, but it was a close thing, and all of us were kept incredibly busy. At least we weren't stuck with caring for those psyker kids, though. That job fell to some of the tribal women and the useless astropath. Doc checked in on them occasionally and said they were doing fine. The rest of us took his word for it and stayed as far away as possible. When the repairs were finished, our journey to the shipyard resumed. Out of necessity, we kept the warp jumps short, and the navigator stuck to only the stablest and best mapped warp currents, as opposed to the fastest ones. It took a good deal longer than we had originally been scheduled to get to our destination, but we did get there in the end. Once the occurrence border was finally in its dock, a shuttle came and took us to the shipyard. While it was an incredible relief to get off that death trap and onto a nice, solid station, the whole thing was rather ruined by the fact that one of Oak's personal retinue was waiting for us there. The report didn't go over as badly as we feared. Oak's assistant was more incredulous than furious. Every part of our story, from the ship's purchase to the Cogton's possession, was met with a sort of baffled exasperation from the man. 
It wasn't until we brought him to the ship and showed him the ungodly mess at the bottom of the elevator that he started believing us. Despite our earlier promise to pin everything on Nubby, we did our best to put a positive spin on his part in things. Of course, in this case, positive spin meant twisting the truth into decorative little knots to paint his behavior as mere incompetence. You know, as opposed to a deliberate subversion of inquisitorial justice in an attempt to score a cheap ship and look good for his boss. In the end, Nubby was fired from his job in supply, which was good, and reassigned back to active duty as part of the squad, which was also good. So all that worked out pretty well. Once we'd convinced Oak's assistant that everything wasn't our fault, we were able to spare some concern for our fellow survivors. Luckily, the man didn't turn out to be the sort of inquisitorial agent who liked ordering mass executions after every little incident. Jim and Hannah were given a lot of praise for fixing so many things, and not going all crazy like every other damn tech priest on the ship. Oak's assistant talked to some senior tech priests at the shipyard, and the Acolytes were given some papers which said they'd officially finished their apprenticeship and were being seconded to the Inquisition for their first independent assignments. We welcomed them to the team and wished them luck with their first interrogator. All of us had been pretty sure the Tech Acolytes would come out fine, but we'd been a bit more worried about what would happen to old Bill, his band of unretired crewmen, and the Hydroponics tribe. We needn't have, though. They were all just accepted as part of the ship. Both Oak's assistants and the Yard's tech priests said that most ships had permanent inhabitants. As long as they didn't get in the way, they'd just become part of the next crew. In our opinion, it was rather cruel to leave them on that horrible ship after all they'd done, but old Bill and the rest seemed happy with the result. We didn't kick up a fuss and wished them all luck. Finally, the half-dozen psychic kids we'd rescued were bundled off to whatever place the Inquisition sends powerful young psychers. Oak's assistant seemed to think that they were the one bright spot in all this mess, and said that their acquisition would do a lot to smooth things over with the boss. We took that as a sign that the creepy little buggers weren't just going to get shot, and didn't speculate whether being raised by the Inquisition was any better. As for the occurrence border itself, the folks working on it said it was definitely repairable. Sure, it was going to take a year of intensive work to get it livable again, but it would fulfill its intended purpose as a disguised Inquisition transport wonderfully. Honestly, we didn't give a damn what happened to the horrible death trap. As long as we never had to set foot on it ever again, we'd call anything a victory. Once all the loose ends were tied up, we were packed onto a ship with Oak's assistant and rode back in relative peace. No one told us to do things, no one interrupted our sleep, and the only tech priests around were Jim and Hannah. It was quite relaxing, and we were in good spirits when we reached Oak's ship. Nubby was called down to his end of the ship for official firing before he was sent back to us. Twitch and Cutter hauled the acolytes down to our regiment's section of the ship and showed them off like proud parents. Doc wandered off to a certain medical section of the ship and wasn't seen for several days. When he finally got back, the poor boy looked utterly exhausted. But he seemed happy. Sarge was called down to Oak's office. Not the whole squad, just him. Everyone speculated about what was going on in there. Maybe Oak was really pissed at us this time. Or maybe he was going to force Sarge to accept a promotion. In the end, our fearless leader marched back out with a glazed expression and went straight to the bar. A few drinks later, we got him talking. Oak wasn't mad at us, and while he had hinted at the promotion, he hadn't carried through. The reason Sarge was called up, and the reason why he was drinking, was because he'd already received the squad's next assignment. 
In a few months' time, a whole new batch of trainees would arrive. It was our job to teach them. Whether they were guardsmen, psychers, or scribes, how to be proper inquisitorial agents. That was a damn tall order, and no mistake. Hell, we didn't even know how to be proper inquisitorial agents ourselves. All of us sat down with Sarge and started drinking, too. This next one was gonna be weird. <laughs> 